All right, let's go to Matthew chapter 6. We are in the Summer on the Mount, looking at the Sermon on the Mount, and man, has it been so fun to dig into this sermon series. So when Matthew wrote this book, from the, uh, wrote this sermon down from Jesus, we realize how symmetrical it is and how uh, wonderfully designed it is. So there's three main sections of this, and we're in the middle section, this main section. We've done Kingdom Identity, and now we're in A Greater Righteousness, and uh, we're going to be looking at right relationships. And so we're going to be looking at how we can trust uh, God and money, and we can get our relationship with our stuff right. Now, the big picture, and I, what, I, what I want you to, to connect with is that Jesus wants you to flourish. So it's real easy. We talked about this in, in the beginning of this with the Beatitudes, that you could view, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uh, for you will be filled. Did I get that one right? Yeah, okay. You can correct me if I've got any verses wrong. Give you permission. So we can look at that as an if-then statement. If I do this, then I'll get this. And we can view the Sermon on the Mount as transactional, as law, and do this, and then you get this. What Jesus is saying is, I want to invite you into a way of being that will cause you to flourish. That when you start to live this lifestyle, your life is going to go from uh, an empty piece of land to this growing, flourishing garden. So we want to invite you into that flourishing reality today. That word blessed, it's a little fuzzy for our vernacular, isn't it? Uh, hashtag blessed. It just feels like, hey, if you do this, you'll get this. But I want you to think of it from an idea of flourishing. So Jacob did such a good job last week. Give it up for Jacob. Just crushed it. Um, he talked about giving to the needy prayer and fasting. I know this, this, um, this thought on fasting is praying with your whole body. Fasting is a great spiritual discipline to step into uh, when you're wanting to go further in the Lord. If you're going through a decision and just want to hear clear, it helps quiet your flesh and allows your spirit man to, to be alive and to hear what the spirit is saying, what the Lord is saying. Um, he also talked about something that, that really struck me well is that he says, it's a, don't be a hypocrite. And that word hypocrit hypocritos, thank you, is uh, the idea of, of an actor, of acting. And how easy it, is it to come into church and just put on a face, put on a mask, and to act? My passion, my desire for our community is this, that we would come fully, authentically before the Lord, hearing his voice, growing in him, and, and, and being our true selves. Doesn't everybody want that? Just to be the true selves with Jesus. So we've made it to... Uh, is there another slide after this? I think there is. Yeah, God and money. Can you go back two slides? Is that Liz? It's Garrett. Give it up for Garrett back there. So we're in the main section. We're in right relationships. Here's the good news. It's all, we're going, we're going straight down the mountain right now. It's, it's awesome. So that Lord's Prayer was packed right in the middle of this, of this Sermon on the Mountain. So now we're going downhill. And speaking of going downhill, I remembered this story when I was 12 years old. So it's Christmas, we're in Florida, so it's 72 degrees, I'm in shorts and a t-shirt, I grew up in Florida, and um, so we're at my grandmother's house, and Christmases were a real challenge for my grandmother, because she went through a really difficult divorce, we all, we all did, when she divorced my grandfather, and uh, so, so Christmases were just a real challenge. So I'm in the backyard as a kid playing. I've got two older sisters, Kristen and Katie, and I've got two girl cousins. So I'm all by myself as a boy, causing trouble on my own. And there's this, there's this really steep hill, uh, grass hill in her backyard going towards the water. And I find this outdoor uh, chair cushion, and I get this idea. If I hit this full speed, I can slip and slide straight down this mountain, and straight down this, straight down this, this grassy knoll. And so I get full speed. And something about the grass, that old cushion, it was like ice. It was like a, it was like a winter's day, you know? Even though it's 72 degrees, I was like sledding down this hill. And my grandmother's looking from the top of her window. 
and she starts to get so tickled about this. I had no idea. She starts to belly laugh. Everyone's like, what is she doing? She comes outside, and she's just full voice, full heart, just laughing at the top of her lungs. And I was thinking, that's what the flourishing life of Jesus looks like. That's what going down the Sermon of the Mount really feels like. Even with all of the difficulty and struggle we've gone through, the Lord wants to belly laugh with us and and let us experience his good life. The Sermon on the Mount isn't a bunch of rules that he's saying, do this or else. He's inviting us in to the good life, the flourishing life. And I want you to see it from that lens, not from if I do this, then I can do this, because that's what I do. Okay, give me the checklist and I'll do it. And the Lord's saying, don't do that. This is a new way of being. So we're going to look at how we respond to money in relationship to Jesus and how money can even impact our anxiety and our worries and the anecdote that Jesus is giving us and how to fight against that. Are you with me this morning? All right, let's jump in. Okay, I'm going to read this whole section. Starting in in verse 6, chapter 6, verse 19. It says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow will be thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So we got a few things to figure out this morning. In verse 19, he's saying, don't store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So we need to figure out what treasures in heaven are. So the word of God is going to reveal this to us. Uh, looking at that word treasure, it's the seros in the Greek. It's where we get the word thesaurus. It's a collection. It's a treasure of words. The word treasure is also a little fuzzy in our vernacular because vernacular, it speaks to what? When you think of treasure, what do you think of? Pirate treasure. Gold bullion, jewels, sunken ships. Uh, does anyone know a, a pirate's favorite letter? Our kids love that. that. That joke never gets old for me either. So treasure, to look at it a little bit deeper, it's really our wealth. It's really what we work for, what we accomplish. And, and another way to say it is stored up things. So you could really say that don't store up for yourself stored up things. Don't store up for yourself stored up things. Think about it when you think, uh, you know, what, what, what have we accomplished? What gives you this, this security? Is it your Dave Ramsey, you know, rainy day fund? You know, is it, is it, is it your stocks? Is it your bonds? Like what, what are you putting your hope in that, that's causing you to, to, to sleep at night? 
Is it money and what you've done or is it Jesus? He's saying, don't store up for yourself treasures on, uh, on earth, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven. This is another way you can think about this. The flourishing life is partnering with Jesus to bring heaven on earth with our stuff. Your resources have an ability to invite people into the kingdom if you will let them. Use them as a tool and a resource to bring heaven on earth. Think less about what you can get right here, right now on earth, and then, but to really partner with Jesus in those ways. So Christy and I, um, I've had a real passion for partnering with the Lord in, in our finances. I was looking for her. She's not here, so I'm all, all, all on my own. You can confirm with her all these stories later, if they're true or not. So we had a friend in college who uh, talked a lot about, like, I want to give a car away one day. So him and a bunch of buddies saved, a bunch of, um, saved money and got a car, and they just, they, they were really modeling this extravagant generosity. And in my heart, I said this, I want to give a car away one day. One day, I'm, I, want to, I want to do that. So Christy and I uh, got a tax return years ago, and, and I was like, I want, to do, I want to do something extravagant for somebody. Like, I want to give a car away. And um, so we had a young man in our internship that had gone through a really difficult season. It just felt like the Lord highlighted him, and so we wanted to bless him. So we did. We bought him, bought him a used car. And somebody at our church that, that kind of knew the situation, he's like, why are you doing this? Like, why are, you, why are you giving a car away? I don't think he's even going to fully, like, understand the extravagance of this gift, and w- will he even take care of it? Is he going to change the oil? You know, all these questions. And I said, listen, there's more to this story. When this young man was 13, his parents were going through a difficult time, dropped him off at a friend's house, and they never came back and picked him up. Never had his own bed to sleep in until he was 18 in this internship. They had his, had his own room. And... What we wanted to do was model the extravagant love of the Father to him. What more and better way to use our resources on earth than to to bless somebody else and usher in the kingdom of God? Now, as a single family income with four kids, it'd be really easy to say like, whoa, hold on, I got to think about college and I got to think about braces and I got to think about this and that. But there was an invitation in that moment to be extravagantly generous, you guys with me this morning? So I'm going to share a couple stories, and it's not out of bragging about what Christy and I have been able to do. It's really about stepping into practicing what we preach and just seeing the testimony of what Jesus has done through our life and how we can use our resources to bless other people. So verse 21 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here's the good news. If your treasure is in heaven, guess where your heart is going to be? In heaven. I've heard it said this way, give me your schedule and give me your bank statements and I'll tell you what you're passionate about. It's a little scary, isn't it? I want to encourage you, find ways for your heart to partner with Jesus because it's not about how much you're giving or if you did a car, it's, just, it's about being obedient to the Lord and to honor him so that money doesn't have a hold of you. Jesus' kingdom is not like our kingdom. So, you know, if you store up treasures in heaven, you're not going to get there one day and be like, okay, Lord, where's my bank account? Where's my, where's my 401k in the spirit, you know? Like, where's my mansion? You know, did I, did I send enough ahead? That's not the way the kingdom of God works. We see this in Matthew 20. It's the parable of the workers in the vineyard. So a uh, vineyard owner, he comes down to the 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 city uh, town square, and he finds some people early in the morning, says, hey, will you work for a denarius today? Let's just call it $100. They're like, yeah, absolutely, we'll do that. He goes at 9 a.m., he goes back, and he says, hey, would you be willing to work in the vineyard? I'm gonna pay you what's fair. And they're like, sure, we'll do it. He goes back at 12 o'clock, middle of the day. Then he even goes at 5 p.m. later in the day, and he finds a couple of people wandering around. He's like, where have you been? What you, why have you been working? He said, we, we looked for work. We couldn't find it. And he said, all right, come with me. We've got a few more hours left. So at the end of the day, he lines everybody up, and he gets the guy that just got there at 5 p.m., and he gives him $100. And everyone's like, wow. So the first guy's like, I must be getting a lot more money. This is going to be great. But everybody lines up, and everybody gets $100. And that first guy, he begins to complain and grumble, right? 
I've been working here all day, and I get the same amount of this guy. And the, the owner hears, hears them grumbling, and he says, didn't I promise you $100, and that was a good deal? And he's like, yeah, you did. And he said, it's my money. Am I allowed to be generous? And he said, yeah, you're allowed to be generous. That's how it is in the kingdom of God. God the Father loves to be generous. There's not this merit system where I'm going to get more than you because I was more righteous than you. We all are under the grace and love of Jesus where he loves to be extravagantly generous to all of us. Isn't that good news? It's so good. It's such good news for all of us. Proverbs 19.70 says, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deeds. Imagine this. The Lord's like, can I borrow five dollars? Something I wanna I wanna get done here. Do you know when you give to the poor, you're lending to the Lord? Now I'm looking for people to give to because I want to lend to the Lord. I don't, you know, in the cashless society, a lot of us don't have 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 physical money with us, but I've started to keep ones and fives with me, and I'm just looking for ways to love somebody. Now I get I understand that sometimes you don't want to encourage uh, a situation that's unhealthy, but for the most part, I'm finding ways to love and bless people in our community. And I can tell you this, I've got a great relationship with the needy people that are around us in our office area in Ghent. They all know Pastor Matt always has a couple bucks for them. And I get to hear their story. I get to pray with them. And there's an openness of what the resources that resources that I have have created in this relationship where I'm getting to minister the heart of the Lord to these people. And there's an openness. You walk down the street, we're waving at each other. We're high-fiving, you know, Pastor Matt, he's my man, you know. I was in 7-Eleven the other day across the street getting a Coke Zero. Anybody Coke Zero fans out there? So I'm in there, and there's a woman who's been pretty disruptive in the community with some mental issues. I'll call her Miss T. And she's in there causing a stir. And you can tell the whole, there's a lot of people in there. Everyone's getting really unsettled. And she's getting louder, and it's, it's kind of turning into a situation. And so I walk in. I'm like, oh, man, this is the last thing I want to deal with right now. But I walk over. It's like, Miss T, how's it going? She looks at me and almost snarls. And I was like, let me get your food today. What do you need? And she's like, oh, my favorite pastor. <laughs> and I said, grab what you want. You know, and everyone's kind of looking at me. And I was like, yeah, come on. Like, anything, anything you want. And like, she's just adding stuff. And I'm like, just come on. Let's go. And everybody's like, the whole atmosphere in the 7-Eleven changed. The workers are like, hey, thank you for doing that. Do you see how your generosity can change? If you're like, no, no, this is just, I'm not going to deal with this. I'm going to leave. And it just, it was just an opportunity to use my stuff to be a blessing to others. Look for ways to use your finances to change things. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. This is going to give us the clue on what it means to store up treasures in heaven. Command those who are rich in this present world, time out. Can I just say, anyone who's in this room can hear my voice. You are rich, wildly wealthy compared to the situation going on in the world right now. The poorest person here is still living like a king compared to other people around the world. God is asking you to steward your finances in a powerful way. Whether you've got a little bit or you've got a lot, he's inviting you in to stewarding your resources in a healthy way. He says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Anybody tracking the stock market right now? It's very uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. There's three things I want you to catch here, and these are going to help you lay up treasures in heaven. Command them, first, to do good. So do good. If, how do you know if you've done something good? If somebody's like, hey, man, that was, that was a really good thing that you did right there, okay? So do good. And to be rich in good deeds. And to be generous and willing to share. In a world where it's like, no, this is mine, and and don't, you know, give me my space. You know, say, okay, yeah, I've got more than enough. Here's a way that I can share with you. In this way, you will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm, for yourselves, as a firm foundation for the coming age. 
so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. That's what I'm after, life that is truly life. Paul didn't say, sell all your goods. It's wrong to, be, to, to have wealth and to be rich. He said, just don't put your trust in money. Don't put your hope in wealth. Um, somebody around Christmas time a year or two ago, they blessed me financially, and I just felt like the Lord was like, save this. I want to, I want to, I want to like instantly be a conduit for, for somebody else in need. I was like, okay, I was ready. And, uh, it's kind of an excitement that happens when you're like, this is the Lord's money. This is going to go, this is going to go to, to something other than me instead of just buying something on Amazon or whatever. Speaking of Amazon, anybody, any, anybody willing to share the, uh, the dangers of Amazon and maybe your own woes with it? I've got a five-minute timer on my Amazon app. You know why? Because they get on there to get, like, we need, we need ant bait things because there's ants all over our, our kitchen right now. But I get on there, and it's like recommended tools. I'm like, whoa, let me check this out, you know? And then I'm just, then 45 minutes later, you're just literally shopping, feeding your flesh on what you could get. And I just realized this is a danger point, and I need to put guardrails on this because the, the enemy wants me to get me thinking about what I can get. And I just, I was like, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. Shut it down. Uh, so anyways, I have this cash, it's Christmas time, and I'm like waiting, and I broke my windshield, so like a day or two after Christmas, uh, somebody was coming to repair it, and the Lord was like, this is it. He's the one. So I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. He's fixing the thing. I walk out there, and I said, I said hey, brother, I said, um, the Lord really blessed me, and, and I want to pass the blessing on to you, you know, and just... You, know, you just kind of see what the Lord wants to do in the situation, you know? just want to bless you. He gives it to me, and it's almost like his jaw hits the ground. He's like, are you kidding me right now? I said, no, man. I just, just wanted to bless you. He said, you have no idea what I'm going through. He said, I just got this job, and I've only done one or two. And he's like, I've been waiting, waiting for my paycheck. He's like, this is literally going to be Christmas presents for my kids. He's got tears in his eyes at just this moment. And I was just thinking, what a beautiful moment that I got to enter into by thinking about others more highly than myself and just using what God's given me uh, to be heaven on earth. You guys getting the picture this morning? Here's a little bit of a different side of this. Christy and I get married, no kids yet. I trade in my Honda Accord and I get a used BMW Z3 convertible. Man, it was fun. It's like the one, like, kind of crazy thing financially that, that we've done. And so I was a pastor at the time, and you would have thought I bought a jumbo jet. People were beside themselves that I had a luxury convertible. And a woman, she came up, she said, can I ask, how did you get a car like that? I was like, well, I traded in my car and I bought it used. I was like, it's, it was like, under $20,000, you know, it's like, if I got a brand new Honda Civic, no one would have batted an eyelash, right? And I told Christy, I was like, I can't take this pressure. I just want to sell, I just want to sell this thing. And the Lord was like, no, don't sell it. You need to learn how to, to receive blessing and not let what other people think about you determine uh, who you are. So uh, I only got to keep it at a year or two more till we had, we had four kids in three years. So things, things took off for us. Uh, so then I drove a 94 Toyota Camry, which I loved, except that the driver's side door wouldn't open and uh, I had to go through the passenger side. <laughs> yes. A loving reminder for any babies in the hallway, it echoes straight back in. So the... Um, yeah, the overflow is on that side. Okay, let's go to um, verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light, if then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? That's saying if what you think you're shining is light, but it's actually darkness. It's actually double darkness. It's actually even more uh, not the thing you're wanting to portray. 
Jesus is getting at the heart of the issue for us. Jacob talked about this. Are you doing things, the right things for the wrong reasons, or are you actually doing the right things because you want to see Jesus and his kingdom shining on earth? Proverbs 22, uh, 28, 22 says, A man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. We want to live in the light. We want to be in the light. We want to be a light that shines on a hill, a city on a hill, and we want to reflect the light of Jesus. Amen? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Here's what I saw here. Money is a master that wants to master you. Money wants total control. There is a spiritual negative authority found in money that wants you to give it its devotion. And it's after us at all times. I think in this society that we're in, we have to be so, so careful not to put our trust in money. It wants to master you. But as we sang this morning, I don't want anybody else. Give me Jesus. You are my one thing. I was thinking about this verse. Lord, you're my one thing. Nothing else. I don't want anything else to master me. I want you to be the one that I'm totally devoted to. I was thinking about this. You need a conservator. Appoint Jesus to oversee your finances. Here's the good news. He always makes the best decisions. You can trust him with your finances. Okay, let's keep going a little bit. Now we're in this, this section about uh, worry and anxiety. It says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon, in all his splendor, was not dressed like one of these. Can I tell you there's grace for you today for what you're going through? If you're like me, you like to plan ahead. Next week, next month, next year, the next five years. I can get stressed out about the next five years. And the Lord's like, Matt, stop. He doesn't give me grace for five years ahead. He gives me grace right here in this present moment. It's been a big thing that I've been recapturing in my life right now. I want to live right at the front edge of this moment in my life. So often we distance ourselves we numb out. We, 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 want it. we don't, don't want to deal with the present moment. We don't want to deal with the future. We just, we just live in this space of constant anxiety, and we're just trying to, to kind of hide from it. And like, Lord, I want, to, I want to be right at the front edge of what you're doing right now. I want to be present with you and your grace in this moment. I don't want to let any anxiety of the future take a hold of me, but I want to receive what you have for me right now. So here's an example of this. Fog. Imagine you're standing just outside your home, surrounded by a dense fog. So thick you can't see the other side of the street in front of you. You look to your right, then to your left, but you cannot see more than 50 feet in any direction. You are surrounded. How much water do you think it takes to create that blanket of fog that has completely isolated you from your world? Are you ready for the answer? A few ounces. The total volume of water in a blanket of fog, one acre around one meter deep, will not quite fill an ordinary drinking glass. How is this possible? First, the water evaporates, and then resulting vapor then condenses into minuscule droplets that permeate the air. In that one acre block of fog, one drinking glass worth of water disperses as some 40 billion tiny droplets suspended in the air creating an impenetrable cloak that shuts out light and makes you shiver. Anybody got to about 4 p.m. in the afternoon and you're just in a bad mood and you don't know why 
everything's bothering you and you feel this anxiety tried, sh- starting to like creep over you and it's this, this, this shivering feeling. I've learned in those moments to go, Holy Spirit, reveal to me what's in my glass of water that's trying to turn into a fog right now and to confuse me and envelop me. And as I begin to do that, sometimes I just, I begin to, to, to understand, oh yeah, I need to send that email, I gotta finish that thing, I gotta make this, this phone call. And I really begin to condense it all down and say, Jesus, show me what you're giving me grace for today so that I can deal with what's right in front of me. But when you just begin to stew on the anxiety of what's ahead and what's happening, and it just, this little thing turns into this enveloping, confusing, don't know where to go fog in your life. Can I encourage you that as you trust in the Lord in all things, and you know that he has your good and benefit in mind, you can trust him, and that fog can begin to dissipate, and you can see what you need to do next. Philippians 4 says this, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So what does this look like? Okay, if you're feeling anxious, you're like, okay, the Bible says don't be anxious. So what do I do? Okay, in every situation, prayer and petition. Lord, I'm, I'm praying to you right now. Help me with this anxiety. Lord, I just petition on behalf of what I'm going through that you would help me. Now, with thanksgiving, present your request to the Lord. Lord, I just thank you that you're good, and I'm just presenting to you what I'm feeling. This is the jar. This is the glass in front of me. Make your request known to God. In the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, this is what's great. You don't always have to understand the situation that you're going through. Life is messy, and it's hard, and you might not have full understanding of it. Lord, I'm confused, and I don't understand why this is happening to, my, to me right now. I don't understand what, what's going on. But thank you that your peace transcends that even understanding of, I don't even need to understand right now. I'm just going to trust you. So the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Then you get put into this safe place where the Lord is guarding you. That's good news for us, isn't it? 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him for he cares for you. I had a fifth grade teacher who sang this salty song. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all my burdens at your feet. And anytime I don't know what to do, I'll cast all my cares upon you. I sing that to my daughter every night. Because that's the verse that got me through some of the hardest times in my life. And when I feel overwhelmed and I don't know what to do, or when my wife was temporarily diagnosed with cancer, or my twins were thought we weren't going to make it, that was the simple song that my heart would sing, and it brought peace to me. You know why? Because it's true, and it's the word of God, and God is living and active and able to help us in our time of need. And I can say, Lord, I can't carry this. I need to cast my cares upon you, for you care for me. First Peter 5, 7. I think some of you need to put that in your, in your notes and, and read that this week and don't let those overwhelming thoughts take hold of you. Verse 30. Um, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So what he's saying is, I'm bringing you into faith. Faith is believing when we cannot see. Sometimes we're having to activate our faith when we're going through a difficult challenge. But as we trust in him, he will make a way for us. He says, do not worry, in verse 31, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He's saying, don't be like the pagans. They're putting their hope and their focus running after things of this world. He's saying, don't do that. That's a pagan practice, to run after those things. I want you to focus on things that are above, heavenly things. He says, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. I think at the heart of this whole section, even a foundational point of the whole Sermon on the Mount would be verse 33 right here. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. 
you can trust him. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So what is Jesus inviting us into? Trusting him with everything that we have, all of our stuff, all of our resources. And he says, don't run after the things of this world because they're going to leave you empty and they're going to make you anxious and overwhelmed. But if you'll trust me like the birds trust that their next meal is going to be taken care of, then you're going to have a peace-filled life. And that's what I want for all of you. That's what I want for our community. I want you to have a peace-filled life. I've referenced many times um, a writer named Jonathan Pennington who wrote the Sermon on the Mount, Human Flourishing. He says this, Christian disciples must be singular in devotion. If not, the result will be anxiety. The way to serve God rather than money is to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, which will result in gaining all that one needs, true human flourishing. Herein lies a deep irony of human existence. According to Jesus' teachings, when people seek to keep everything together and provide for themselves apart from God, the result is not the sought-after peace, but rather anxiety. When you spend your whole life trying to accumulate enough for all the things, you realize that that's actually brings a level of anxiety that you don't need. But when we trust Jesus with all things, that peace will come to us. He says, there is an uh, organic connection between the warring against greed and the exhortation against anxiety. Greed causes anxiety. It is the non-God directed heart that is laying up earthly treasures that ironically does not have peace. But the people who live like the flowers and birds, apparently foolish from the world's financial perspective, are the ones who are free from anxiety. They seek first God's kingdom, and as a result, get all their needs met without anxiety. This is not to say that all anxiety is caused by greed. There are many other sources of anxiety, real and perceived. But it is to say that greed will inevitably result in the double-souled anxiety that is the opposite of human flourishing. I thought that was really good. So let's stand together. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you that you have a kingdom and you are ruling and reigning in that kingdom. And you're a good king, and we trust you. I thank you, Jesus, that you know everything we need before we even ask. And you're a good, generous father. And Lord, right now, we just, we just choose to remove um, our own ability to provide for ourselves. We just submit and we surrender to you, Jesus. And we say, we trust you. Lord, would you show us the way? Lord, we thank you that you're going to provide for all the things that we need. Lord, it's easy for me to think about college for my kids and braces and the, and the next set of tires that I need. And, and Lord, I just choose to just lay all that down and say, Lord, I trust you that you have the grace that I need for today. And I don't need to worry about tomorrow because you are a good provider. And Lord, I thank you that you're lifting anxiety off of us right now. You're lifting fear of the future off of us right now as we just begin to trust you. Thank you, Lord God, that you're very rich and you're very generous. And Lord, you know what we need, Lord. And we just choose to trust that, that you're the God that can open up the floodgates for us. And Lord, we just choose not to, in our own strength, try to figure everything out. We just trust you today. We bring those prayers before you. And right now, Lord, I just pray that you begin to shift our hearts from self-reliance to God-reliance. And Lord, where money has tried to be a, have, have mastery over us, Lord, I just pray that you would reveal to us ways that we can put you back in the driver's seat of our hearts. Lord, I so deeply want to experience more of your glory, more of your presence. I want to be changed from the inside. I want to worship you with every single aspect of my soul. And I realize today that it also has to do with how I steward my resources, Lord. 
where my treasure is, Lord, there my heart will be also. Lord, let my heart, let our hearts be with you. Before we close, I want to give this invitation. The best decision you can make is to fully give your heart to Jesus. He is a lavish, loving Father, gracious and merciful, forgiving, kind, loving. He desires nothing more than to spend eternity with you and for you to experiencing to experience the flourishing life.